and uh, thank you, Dr. Richard, for inviting me over to speak on hydroponics slash uh, soilless agriculture. Uh, I've been in this uh, field for more than 24 years now, and I began my journey here, right here in Australia. And uh, after having learned for about eight years and got a certain degree of confidence, I took back soilless agriculture knowledge that I learned in Australia back to India and pioneered the concept uh, for the first time. So when I first went to India and spoke about soilless agriculture, uh, everyone was bewildered. They said, how is it possible to grow things without soil? Because nobody had even heard about soilless agriculture. Uh, although it, it, it had been in uh, a practice in Australia from the early 1960s, I'm told. And uh, my uh, one of my mentors, Joe, Joseph Agius from New South Wales, was a mentor throughout my learning journey. So then after having reached India, I first understood that I need to teach people because any technology is only as good as the skill in a person. So you can have all the technology, but if you do not know how to exploit the technology, then it doesn't make any sense. So that's how my journey began. And uh, I have trained close to about 15 to 16,000 students in the last 16 and a half years in uh, different kinds of formats. And I've been a grower myself. I also ran a farm for five years in Bangalore in India. Bangalore is a city in India, which is known as the information technology capital of India, South India. And uh, I was a grower supplying to Walmart Group, the American Walmart Group, for about five years. I've been uh, teaching for as, as much as 16 years now. And uh, I'm a trainer, auditor. I also do a lot of damage control where things go awfully wrong on farms. So I audit them and give them the right uh, procedures to follow so that uh, the farmers become more profitable. I've also done a lot of projects. Some One of my biggest projects that I did was in India in 2019 and 20, which is a 50-acre hydroponic farm growing close to about 25 types of vegetables of all kinds. Uh, well, I've also been on the uh, policy-making uh, panel of the government of India. Uh, every year for about 10 years, they would come back to me asking for, you know, opinions uh, for policy making. So that's been an interesting journey for so many, almost uh, two plus decades. And uh, I'm going to take you through very quickly uh, certain... Yeah, so I, like I said, I started my uh, Indian project first with, uh, uh, you know, teaching people. So the first thing I did was uh, to set, uh, create a slogan. And the slogan was called in our country in Hindi, in the Hindi language as paid baro, which means fill your tummy. So with the, I, I also was lucky to have a mentor called Peggy Bradley from the Institute of Simplified Hydroponics in the United States. And she came down to India to help me set up the first uh, Simplified Hydroponics Training Institute in India. So like I said, I've trained people in various formats, three days and 15 days, 90 day formats. And uh, many of my students uh, have moved on to do some really good work, uh, both as hobby as well as commercial uh, in this field. So I believe that uh, food, or rather good food is a human birthright. And every human being must uh, have access to affordable and nutritious food. Uh, it's not about being rich or poor or anything because food is a very fundamental thing that humans need. Like uh, the famous Mahatma Gandhi of India, uh, who we call as the father of the nation in India, he always said that a hungry man is an angry man. So once you have good food and highly nutritious food, I think most of your problems in the world can be solved. A lot of violence comes from, basically comes from hunger. 
So now let's get to what is hydroponics. Hydroponics is basically a method of growing plants without the use of soil, where in hydroponics, the roots of the plants have are either dipped in nutrient-rich, well-oxygenated, water-soluble nutrients are mixed into clean water, and the roots pick up their nutrients as the water flows through the roots. Uh, the word hydroponics was coined by an American uh, researcher called William Gerrick in the early 1930s. So hydro and hydroponics is basically two words. Hydro comes from Latin and uh, ponics is basically ponos or meaning to work. So we can say hydroponics is basically working in water or water working. However, hydroponics is also a subset of a larger uh, domain called soilless culture because when you uh, when you substitute soil with something uh, which is a sterile media it could be just water which we just said is called hydroponics or you could have a media which does exactly what a so what soil does so what does soil do soil basically holds nutrients soil basically holds water and also soil gives anchorage for the plant to stay straight and if you could replace soil with a medium which is sterile then what happens is uh, you start your plants from day one in a very clean uh, and sterile atmosphere or environment as we all know today most of our soils have been degraded uh, over the centuries of you know continuously growing plants and using a lot of synthetics and pesticides and over fertilizing the land and in some cases, there's hardly any fertilizer. Or in some cases, there are soils which contain even a lot of heavy metals. And precisely the reason why so much of cancer uh, is uh, prevalent in the world today is thanks to heavy metals and pesticides that are used, overused in agriculture. So hydroponic comes as a breather or soilless agriculture comes as a breather because you start right from the day you begin you, you make sure that the seeds are in a sterile uh, condition. The media is in a sterile condition. The water quality is uh, zero microbiological contamination free. And you ensure that the journey begins in the most cleanest manner. So a uh, hydroponic farming setup is more like uh, the uh, integrated, uh, uh, sorry, uh, like the ICU in a hospital, it's very clean. And uh, people have to be absolutely careful of hygiene and how, how it's like when you had COVID and everyone was wearing gloves and masks and things like that. In in this kind of agriculture is exactly the same. We use gloves, we use masks, we use hair caps, we do a lot of things just to make sure that we do not contaminate the plants at any stage of its growth. So what are the advantages of soilless or hydroponic cultivation? There are several uh, advantages. One is water efficiency. A lot of people in conventional agriculture tend to either overwater the plant or underwater the plants. And the beauty of soilless agriculture, like any other uh, form of agriculture, agriculture is a science. And there's so much science behind uh, in agriculture. So when you do something, there's a reason why you do it. There's a scientific reason why you do it. Or if you just said, I'm going to observe my plant for half an hour, it, there is a science or a reason why we do that. So uh, while there is art, there's an art form in agriculture, there's also science in agriculture, and a lot of science. It's not rocket science, but definitely perfect science. So water efficiency, we make sure that we just give the right amount of water based on various uh, parameters. It could be by virtue of humidity. It could be by virtue of temperature. It could be due to wind stress biotic uh, abiotic factors as they call them so we can make sure that we actually save a lot of water so the savings of water uh, in around the world people normally say we save 90 percent of the water which is really not true it could be anywhere between 40 percent to about say 65 percent 70 percent depending upon the crop and the weather and the atmosphere i mean the conditions of that particular day uh, like evapotranspiration and various things. Nutrient control, we just give the right amount of nutrition to the plants. We make sure 
that the electrical conductivity or parts per million of every element. So all plants need about 13 solid elements and about three gases. The gases are carbon dioxide, hydrogen and oxygen, which are presently free. And uh, all the other 13 elements are in available form. When I say available form, they're basically charged particles, either negatively charged or positively charged. If any of these uh, elements are in a stable atomic form, they do not, they cannot be taken up by the plants or they are not in an available form. And there's a lot to talk on that subject, but however, we make sure that the electrical conductivity and the pH value of the water, because there is a range of pH within which the elements are all in a soluble form. And if they go either way, uh, less or more <clears throat> beyond the range, then you would get precipitation of different kinds of elements or you would actually have too much availability of a particular element, which will cause toxicity, or you'll have a deficiency of a particular nutrition nutrient. Then space utilization, you can definitely bring down, you can grow more number of plants in lesser space because there is very little competition at the root zone between two plants. Because like if you're growing two plants in two different grow bags, for example, there's hardly any competition with each other for nutrition. Whereas in the soil, Plants tend to compete with each other and steal, try to steal nutrition from one another. That's the reason why you do not get uniform yield. Then faster growth rate, actually, to say the truth, when you say faster growth rate, it's more, uh, you know, it's just that when you grow a plant with all, with perfect control over the plant, you actually see the plant growing as per its genetic potential. So to be honest with you, plants cannot grow I mean, just faster just because we use hydroponics, but the, yes, it's notional. When you look at it, it definitely looks like it's growing faster because it gets everything perfectly. It has the right access to oxygen, water, nutrition, and what have you. Year-round production, again, <coughs> year-round production is also possible, but we must remember that it also depends on what kind of structure we use for that particular plant. So when you choose a particular crop, you got to choose the structure according to the environment of that area. So yes, you, you and if you can maintain the right conditions of temperature and humidity and various such factors, you can definitely grow plants uh, literally year round. So then you have reduced pest and disease pressure to some extent, yes, but it is not that plant pest and disease understand what technology you're using and that they'll keep away from hydroponic plants or something, but you have greater control because you you do regular scouting and uh, you you take actions well in advance there's flexibility and adaptability like i said you can have systems for various types of plants like you want to grow normally leafy vegetables grow very well by people's experience in absolutely hydroponic systems where this water is the medium but you must remember one more thing is that water uh, uh, is has very little buffering capacity. Soil has very high buffering capacity and any other solid media like say coconut peat for that matter or peat moss, they have somewhere in between buffering capacity. So while this whole thing hydroponics looks beautiful and nice, we must understand that the window of opportunity to take action is very limited. So it gives you a small window to take action because they are they do not have that kind of buffer which soil plants have. Like, for example, if you did not water a soil plant in time or maybe even a day later, you may not see so much of difference in the plant. Whereas here, you've got to be on top of things, make sure that you feed the plant and you water the plant at the right time, and then everything is much better. Environment sustainability, you can reduce chemical inputs and minimize land use. And the good thing about soilless agriculture is that you can use any place any place it could be just a rooftop a flat rooftop as long as you got access to some clean water and sunlight so this is a very good technology because we really have nothing to do with the soil and the produce quality is very high i will be showing you a few pictures towards the end of this lecture and you can have a look at the quality of the produce both commercial and hobby uh, what i have done personally and then like i said uh, most important thing is that today we talk about fresh we say this food is fresh. We go to Woolworths, we go to Coles, and we see 
all the uh, broccoli and all the vegetables kept in a nice cool manner and we think wow 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 this is fresh but what is really fresh in my opinion fresh is something that you harvest and have it on your table to eat within four to six hours now uh, the good thing is we uh, the the bad thing is that today most of our vegetables what we eat come from kilometers you know they, we call them food miles they come from la long distances and number one you pay a lot of money for it and secondly just because it's cool it just doesn't mean it's fresh so we can we have the ability to especially in a country like australia where most homes have reasonable amount of backyard and front yards you can actually grow a lot of vegetables using this little technique and you can you do not have to go overboard uh, in the sense by putting in very high high end systems you can do it in very simple manner so this has great uh, uh, what do you call uh, usability in for communities and the whole idea should be to eat uh, grow local and eat local so that is possible using hydroponic or soilless technology so my projects in india just a few of them i could put down because it's a short lecture my first project was at an orphanage which was attached to a poor catholic christian school that was funded by a lady from ireland and they had about 20 often children from the age of 5 to 15 and i set them up with a 400 square feet i'll show you a few pictures later i set them up with a 400 square feet garden and using all kinds of recyclable materials we built a garden and in 6 months time the children had learned how to grow their plants and they had uh, teachers who were their supervisors and one teacher would supervise about four students and they ran uh, the whole thing for months together and uh, we could actually see the health of the children improve for the simple reason that uh, for the simple reason that they were eating high quality food and uh, with all the nutrition that is required we also did a project at the Environment Management Policy Research Institute in Bangalore on again on a rooftop. And that was also a wonderful project with us about 250 square feet or something. We did one in a state called Kerala in South India, which was again for an old age home. Then we did uh, another one for a non-government organization, which basically had a lot of villages around, I mean, under its uh, control. And uh, we did a technology demonstrator where others would be brought there from these villages to learn how to grow plants in hydroponics. We did a live hydroponics display at an exhibition in a place called Coimbatore in India. And that was a really one of my best projects because it was 3,000 square feet. And I had to start building this garden right from 90 days before the exhibition began. So it was one of the first, it was a live display of hydroponics and a live display of more than 30 different types of uh, vegetables and herbs growing out there. So that was loved by everyone who passed by. We had almost 200,000 footfalls. Uh, then I also set up India's first commercial hydroponics farm with controlled environment. And uh, the greenhouse was imported from South Korea. And we grew strawberries in them. And it was really good. And pub people really loved the strawberries that they, we sold to them and they had never seen such strawberries before in India. Uh, like I said, I've been consulting and helped a lot of commercial hydroponics farms in 16 years. Um, one of my largest projects was a 50 acre project with more than 25 kinds of vegetables that included leafy greens, wine crops and uh, root vegetables. Presently in India, I'm doing two commercial hydroponics projects, and that is basically to grow high quality uh, spinach, baby spinach and the normal spinach as well. That project has just begun and it should be in operation in about two months time. So some research and development I did was one of the, my pet project was, un, I mean, it happened in COVID because all my students who were at my training center had to leave and go home. So I did some research on turmeric and using uh, cocoa peat as a media. The, the following are the uh, achievements of that particular research and development. So we grew these, uh, we grew these uh, turmeric in what we call grow bags, you know, horticultural grow bags with cocoa peat as the medium. And 
normally in soil in india farmers if they achieve between 700 to 900 grams from a single plant they are very happy and we took a simple 60 gram uh, rhizome of turmeric and in a single grow bag took the 60 gram rhizome to 8.170 kilograms in a nine months that which is the crop cycle for turmeric so that was a huge difference in the yield and a very path breaking result that we got and as some of you may know turmeric also contains something called curcumin curcumin is mainly uh, extracted from turmeric and mainly used in anti cancer medicine and uh, you might have seen them in the shops here you get curcumin capsules so the variety which i tried uh, on my r and d was uh, called the salem variety uh, which is a famous variety in india and Salem normally gives just about 3% of curcumin, whereas we achieved a breakthrough of 5.91% of curcumin. And that was another wonderful achievement of this R&D. Um, most farmers, turmeric farmers around the world, ginger farmers, and especially people who grow root crops, um, they are they suffer from a lot of uh, you know diseases that come from the soil which damage most of the almost 40 percent of the harvested produce becomes unusable or unsaleable sellable so uh, this particular in this particular experiment we also did lab testing so we sent uh, samples of our turmeric after harvest to the laboratory to test for my bad microbiology and the best part is they, obviously, there cannot be zero microbiology, but the, the good part was there was no bad microbiology like E. coli, Salmonella, or any of those things. And the, another wonderful thing was, like I said, most farmers lose about 40 to 45 percent of their crop just because they were diseased uh, harvested rhizomes. And here they were so clean because they were grown in a sterile medium, and almost 99 percent of the turmeric was saleable in the market which is something great. You know, people keep talking about population increasing in the world and by 2050, we'll have 9 billion people. I also, and they say we got to produce almost three times what we are producing now to be able to feed such a huge population in future. But I'm also of the opinion that if we could reduce losses in our harvested vegetables as we speak today, we definitely will be uh, uh, you know, well placed to look after a burgeoning or a growing population of the world. We can also, uh, you know, sort of make sure that we reduce the losses uh, because of diseases and things like that. And here we could prove it. Ninety-nine percent of the turmeric was saleable material. There were no heavy metals at all uh, because we don't use any. Uh, uh, we don't use any uh, chemical pesticides or any of those things which contain mercury, arsenic and those kind of uh, heavy metals. So we, it returned a zero heavy metal report. And there was no chemical pesticide residue because in all my 24 years, I'm happy to say that I've never used a single chemical pesticide. Uh, I mostly use cultural, physical, uh, biological controls. Yes, life is hard when you do not use chemical pesticide. You've got to be really, really on top of things. And... Uh, when you use other methods other than chemical pesticides, you you have to use those uh, kind of methods as a preventative uh, before the fact. So, which calls for a lot of scouting. Scouting means looking around for pest and disease all the time and finding it just when it begins, not when it's already 50% or 60% spread through the crop. So the future of hydroponics, there is a great future for hydroponics, definitely. The, there are a lot of technological advancements happening and uh, people have begun to use them. There's a lot of integrated, uh, I mean, integration with artificial intelligence and Internet of Things. Uh, I also believe that, yes, technology to some extent is very important, but uh, I, I do tell my students that uh, I'm not a great believer of high technology, but I'm very much a believer of right technology. You need to have the right technology because ultimately in agriculture, you've got to put the least and take the most. That's what otherwise a farmer putting in a lot of money into technology and, and it eats up into his uh, profits. And as you know, most farmers in the world just about 
get by every year as uh, because there's so much of global warming and so many different uh, factors that affect them. There's a lot of expansion going to happen in urban agriculture for sure. There is uh, there are a lot of companies in the United States and Europe which are using uh, just you know abandoned buildings converted into in I mean uh, vegetable growing or herb growing uh, structures. So there's a lot of things happening in that field as well. And like I said, uh, the cities should be able to self-sustain themselves. The best way to have good food and fresh, really fresh food would be having all these systems in the uh, urban and peri-urban uh, limits of the each of the cities. And it's a possibility. And there are lots of people working on it, which is a good sign. Like I said, yes, you can customize for specific crops. You can have different kinds of systems and you basically use what works best and uh, you can improve the growth rate and the yield and the nutritional content. Sustainable and climate res resilient agriculture. Like I said, yes, there's a lot of water efficiency and you can reduce a lot of environmental impact and resilience to uh, climate change induced challenges such as drought, and uh, extreme weather events. So integration with renewable energy, lots of, because energy, as you know, is expensive and people are now using um, renewable energy like solar and wind power and what have you, uh, basically to reduce reliance on uh, fossil fuels and uh, minimizing carbon footprint. So that's another thing about the future of hydroponics. People are definitely using a lot of renewable energy. Commercialization, market growth, like I said, consumers demand fresh locally grown produce and uh, that demand continues to rise. So commercialization of hydroponic farming will expand and uh, it will all be within the cities. Research and development, as like I said, is going on. It never ends and we keep trying to make it better and better. So lots of research development is there in agriculture. They're using a lot of technology and they're collecting a lot of data because people talk of artificial intelligence in agriculture. But I mean, artificial intelligence is only as good as the amount of data that you have and the amount of you can have a lot of data, but you've got to make sense out of the data. So if you say I'm going to grow this particular tomato in Bundaberg, then there has to be years and years of data for artificial intelligence to suggest what to do at every step. Education and training, like I said, yes, there are a lot of people training uh, because skill is the most vital thing in any in any field of life, and especially in agriculture. As we become more and more scientific, uh, when we start doing more scientific agriculture, we will definitely need to have very good skill. So that's one thing that I have been pushing all my life, and I tell people it's not the technology. It's the person behind the technology. What is the skill level that a person has? And any amount of reading, any amount of watching YouTube videos, ultimately, your skill comes from practical experience. So when you work and you go through the challenges and you personally learn what those challenges are, then you become a really skilled uh, farmer. Global adoption, like I said, yes, it's a need of the art. And if you see, especially if you look at the Middle East, like Saudi Arabia, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, Bahrain, all these countries are now <clears throat> worried about food security. And there are hundreds of hydroponic farms coming up in these countries. So there's a lot of things happening in the world of hydroponics or soilless agriculture. I'm going to show you some pictures now. Uh, like they say, a picture says, uh, uh, speaks louder than words. So I'm going to show you a few pictures. My first project at an orphanage in India, this was a little project that I did for an orphanage. You can see the tables out there. They are basically <clears throat> made out of, uh, you know, shipping crates that people sort of chuck away. So all the shipping crates were made into tables like these. And the black uh, little thing that you see there uh, where the plants are growing on the periphery of the plants, that's basically what we call as black mulching sheet. And the media is all cocoa peat. And you can see we're growing different kinds of vegetables there. And uh, this was a 400 square feet garden that I built for these young children in Bangalore, India. And they were all given uh, a training. And uh, they learned over six months. And they, 
little kids, but they learn so well. And I always believe that children love love to grow plants, but they need to be shown an opportunity. Their health improved, and that was one another great thing. And my mentor, like I said, Peggy Bradley from the United States, she's done a lot of work in almost 23 countries in the South and Central America. And she's done some amazing work to improve sustainability. And Let me ask a quick question on, on that. How are the beds being watered? By hand. Oh, by hand. Yes, okay. they're all watered by hand and uh, with little watering cans. Uh, which are not uh, this not made of metal, but because the nutrition nutrients may interact with that, so we use plastic uh, watering cans, and they regularly they are watered. So that's how these plants are grown by the students, and they don't overwater them. And there's a way of finding out without using any instrument. You just take your little finger and just poke your finger into the media, and if you know that it is moist and not wet if it's wet then you don't water because you know the media has already has a lot of water but if it's moist you know that yes it's between dry and wet so when it's moist you can water the plant and also it depends on what is the condition at that time if it's very cloudy or is what what are the conditions so that was what was taught to the little boys and girls and they understood initially it was a little hard but yes but this is not like i said this is something that anyone can learn anybody can learn it there's nothing much to do with a lot of education. Yes, there's a little bit of science here and there that you need to know, but uh, if you have a basic twelfth uh, up to 12th grade, whatever science you've learned, you can easily master this. So, And you can see on the top, we have a little shade net because the area where I did this project was extremely a bit too hot. So we had a 50-50 shade net, which cuts about 50% of the light. So the plants are more relaxed and they don't lose a lot of water to evaporation. Because plants lose water in two ways. One is by evaporation of the water from the media itself. And then, of course, you have the transpiration loss. That means the plants take up water for their own use and they uh, leave it out through the stomata, stomatal openings. They allow them to uh, evaporate into the air. So that's the reason we used a little shade net. It's a very simple system. Of course, we did not have any insect screens and those kind of things around. But the idea was to train the students uh, uh, to go through the challenges of pest and disease and various other things. So it was a very, this was my first project and it was a wonderful project. So I, I really loved this project very much. So you can see my uh, little kids. These are the orphanage kids with my mentor who came down from uh, United States to help me set up my uh, training. So these little kids were trained and uh, they all uh, were very possessive about their garden and they all learned uh, how to grow their own veggies and it definitely improved their health. Uh, when you see them right now, they were very skinny and bony. And in six months time, they literally ate everything from this garden. And they had uh, around 20 types of vegetables to eat. So they did a great job. And uh, that's me scouting. Like I said, uh, when you work with plants, you need to do something called scouting. Scouting is not something that you come in early morning and just look at the plant and see, oh, no pest and disease and feel good about it. You actually, when you have nothing else to do on a farm, you you must be scouting. That means scouting is kind of observing. You observe, you watch your plants, you look for any pest and disease that might come. Pests do not come at a particular time. The different pests occur or different diseases occur at different times or different conditions. Like when it's hot and dry, you have... For example, you have spider mites or you have mite problems. When it's hot and humid, you get fungal diseases. So you, the more you look look at your plants closely and the more time you spend with plants, plants are like children, you know, they need, you're, you're like a parent for your plants. They're like children, so you, they have their own challenges. So you need to, and the worst part is they can't speak or cry and they don't speak loudly. So you've got to understand them and you've got to have empathy uh, when you work with plants. So I tell my students, when you work with plants, you've got to be looking at your plants through the eyes of a mother. A mother has a lot of empathy, right? So you've got to have that kind of empathy towards your plants. So when you feel with your plants, you, uh, you, you know, automatically you will do the right thing. You will have your dinner, lunch, you'll have your water to drink only after you made sure your plants are happy, just like a mother would do. So here, this is again teaching students how to hydrate 
uh, what we call as coconut peat. Coconut peat is basically from the husk of the coconut. So it comes in block form so that it can be easily transported. So when you pour water, it expands. And cocoa peat is another wonderful medium. It can hold up to five times its weight. It can hold water. It has very good amount of air-filled porosity. That means once, the water, once you poured water into the media and it uh, drains out, uh, the, the spaces where the water has escaped should be replaced with a lot of oxygen. And the more oxygen there is at the root zone, the better is the ability of the plant to be able to pick up nutrition because oxygen acts like a catalyst. Yeah, so this was at my farm, a little board. <laughs> and that those were the days when I had begun my journey in India. So it was on my commercial strawberry farm. So they just put a little board to tell people that you're standing at the future of something different. So you can see here, these are my soilless cherry tomatoes, which I was growing in my greenhouse. I did a lot of R&D as well and uh, tried various types of seeds of different crops. So this was one of my cherry tomatoes that we grew long back. Here you can see this board. Uh, basically, like I said, I never used a chemical pesticide in 24 years, which I'm quite proud of. And uh, basically, we had this board telling everybody in the farm that you're not to use chemical pesticides or weedicides. All treatments are as prescribed by the agronomist. So without the permission of the agronomist, nobody is to use any chemical pesticides without permission. And the best part was we hardly had to use any. We, we didn't use any. So this was the same garden in the orphanage. You can see, you know, you can see we are using very simple plastic tubs and things like that. And you might see on the tubs uh, in some places, you can see little pipes coming out of the tubs. Now, many people ask me, what is that for? What we do is basically when you water the plant, a lot of the nutrition comes out as a drain, right? So we collect them in old uh, bottles like Coca-Cola bottles or any of these bottles. We collect the water and we reuse that water back. We water back the media with the same water. So you don't lose on water. You don't lose on precious nutrition, which is not being used by the plant. So you, we basically end up recycling that water as long as it's not contaminated. And the only thing is you do not take the water from one tub and give it in another tub because if there is a disease in a particular plant in this tub, it will spread to the other. So it's only within the same tub, you can keep recycling that water n number of times. That's my uh, mentor from Australia, uh, Joe Aegeus. He had come to India on my invitation. And this was at a where we were growing spinach plants using soilless agriculture technology. And you can see all the plants are growing in what we call as plastic troughs, which are food grade plastic tubs, uh, I mean, plastic uh, troughs. And this was a picture we took there and he was quite happy to see the, the spinach growing so well. What you're seeing is basically in these rows were all harvested and we harvest them uh, in a sequential manner. So when we plant one acre, we make them into eight different sections and we seed them accordingly. And the beauty of spinach is that we we are we were able to take up to 40 cuts from a single planting. That means you do not have to keep on putting a, one seed and getting a spinach. We put about eight to 10 seeds per slot, per position. And once it is grown to a certain point, we just chop them off. Then we leave it alone and keep watering it for the next seven or eight days. And then on the eighth day, we come back to the same grid and again, a harvest so it's so amazing that we could we don't we we could from this farm i would supply about 120 kilograms of spinach to walmart every single day except except for sunday so this is a farm in india this is again uh used styrofoam boxes and this was at the exhibition i mentioned where we did the live demonstration a lot of these styrofoam boxes are just you know thrown away and sent into the landfills and stuff. So we collected these uh, from a company that used to supply medical stuff. So before they could throw it away, we went and got all these and we sanitized it and we were growing different plants using recycled materials. Just me trying to teach students at one of the places in Bangalore, I was trying to teach them how to do what is known as 
broadcast seeding. So seeding is, there are various ways of seeding. One is direct planting. One is you grow them in a seedling tray and then transplant them. And there's another method which is known as broadcasting. So some some of the herbs and stuff can be just, you know, you put the seeds into furrows and then close them and you grow them in the same uh, little tub like this. And uh, I'm basically in this picture, I'm just demonstrating to students how it is done. These are some of the vegetables I used to grow on my farm for my own self because I used to live on the farm. And uh, the nearest market was about 50 kilometers from where I was. So I would grow these in a separate shade house, again, using soilless agricultural technique. So you can see I have tomatoes, zucchini, green chili and onions and uh, radish and those kind of things, zucchinis, you can see. So I was quite self-sufficient on my farm. I didn't have to go anywhere to buy my basic vegetables. Here, Peggy is uh, my mentor, is teaching the students uh, how to transplant. So these, uh, this plant she's holding in her hand is basically a plant that is grown in a seedling propagation tray. And then when it's ready and it has uh, got its second set of leaves, uh, uh, you it's a time for transplanting into a grow bag or into some other place. So what you see uh, slightly below is the seedling tray where you can see all the plants so all grown in a nursery condition. And then you put them into grow bags one by one. So this is a picture of my, my mentor Peggy showing, uh, teaching the kids at the orphanage how to do transplanting of saplings. Here again, this is a farm worker of mine, uh, early morning harvest of uh, beautiful spinach, which used to be put into 100 gram little packing, a very spe specific kind of packing, which is laser micro perforated packing so that the leaves can breathe. And... Uh, so this picture is of uh, early morning. We would begin harvesting by around uh, five o'clock. And by 11, we would have everything packed and ready to send to the store. This is uh, again a picture of my spinach farm with my workers. This again had, I used to always have local agriculture college students and university students come to my training center in Bangalore in India. And uh, they would spend a few hours with me and I would explain exactly what I'm doing now. I would be doing physically one-on-one -on -one with them. Yeah, this was at the old age home. I was just trying to show, you can see the roots hanging down from that uh, styrofoam sheet. And uh, that's grown in something called uh, deep water culture. That means uh, there's only nutrition in water. And you can look at the roots. They're so beautiful and white. That actually shows the health of the plant. Very often what happens is in uh, soil agriculture, we do not know, we don't know what's happening in the root zone. The Whatever happens in the root zone is so important, what we call in agriculture as, as rhizosphere. It's something that you can't see with your eyes, naked eyes, but the good thing in hydroponics is you can pick up the plant and have a look at the roots regularly so you know what's happening, whether there's a fungal attack or anything. So when you see these roots in such pristine white condition, <laughs> it means that the plants are healthy. So we normally I say, as the root, so the shoot. That means if the root is in good condition, the shoots will definitely be most often in very good condition. Except that, of course, they do go through various abiotic stresses and things. It's a big subject and uh, cannot be taught in one hour. But yes, it's just a glimpse of what can be done. So I would also do a lot of seminars. I used to be speaker on a lot of conferences around India and other parts of the world as well. So this is just a picture of me uh, giving a talk on the business opportunities in soilless agriculture. Here, like I said, I did my turmeric uh, research and uh, I had every month from month one onwards at the end of every month, we do something called a root zone analysis. So when we, what we do is if we have 100 grow bags, we pick up, we open up a particular grow bag and have a look at what's happening in the root zone. So this picture I remember was around seven months down the line in a nine month cycle of the crop. Mm -hmm. And you can see this is just from a single grow bag. I've got this kind of turmeric, which you do not get in soil agriculture. Yeah, so there was an article that, a lot of articles were published in India about our breakthrough 
in turmeric farming. So that's me basically after having cleaned all the turmeric, uh, just, you know, chopping it so that we could put them on a small weighing scale. So that's a picture of me basically, you know, making them into smaller pieces. This was my student. And like I said, I was able to achieve 8.17 kilograms in my uh, research and development. And uh, last year, I was pleasantly surprised when one of my students broke my own record and did 9.65 kilograms of turmeric from a single grow bag. To be honest with you, I am not very happy even with 9.65. I'm sure that... Uh, like uh, what I did was during my, during the COVID times, it was very hard. But uh, if I were to do it today, I would definitely aim at even 13 or 14 kilograms per grow back. But yes, it's a work in progress. Yeah, so this was a little poster that we was selected uh, for the Protected Cropping Association Conference in Brisbane last year, where I participated. So my poster was selected and I was allowed to put a poster. So basically talking about our turmeric, what we did, 10 times more yield compared to soil, no heavy metals, near zero microbiological contamination, high curcumin content, like I said, 99% of saleable harvest, and backed by so many years of my soilless experience. So this was, gentlemen and ladies, what I did for the last 24 years. I'm always available for any uh, any queries that you may have, I'm sure Dr. Richard will share this with you. And my mobile number is there, my email ID, My you can have a look at my website. Um, and you can also see about 60 different videos on my YouTube channel. I have a YouTube channel where I talk about hydroponics and the, the hard side of hydroponics. I don't talk on the rosy side of things. I normally touch upon the truth of hydroponics because a lot of people think hydroponics is very simple and they don't have to do much work. So I bring out the truth about the science before people go and lose a lot of money in this field. So thank you everyone. And if you have any questions, you're most welcome to ask me and I'll be happy to answer them.